with Marty in my very first year of graduate school. I had come right out of teaching, and uh, I was so eager to get started. Marty did point out at the beginning of our mentorship that he doesn't actually study self-control. In fact, we um, naively, I think, called it self-discipline. I was just like, oh, call it self-discipline. That's what I used to call it when I taught. Uh, I didn't actually recognize the fact that nobody else in psychology was calling it self-discipline. So uh, that was a little bit of a rookie error. But, um, and if I could go back in time, I think I would call it self-control, just to avoid confusion, right? Um, it's often uh, called a jingle or jangle fallacy when you like name your construct something different. So if you are gonna go and study purpose, just call it purpose and not something else. Like, everyone's like, what is she studying? What is this capstone about, right? Um, so we called it self-discipline, and we had a measure of self-discipline that was a, a composite. So it was self-reported, uh, a questionnaire using the brief self-control scale, and also another one. Teachers filled out the same thing about you. Uh, your parents filled it out about you. We had a, a, a questionnaire that was called a discounting questionnaire, where you had a series of questions that were all like this. Which would you prefer, $2 today, or $4 in a month? $3 today, or $10 in a year? And it's a series of questions, and you can um, do a little math and kind of calculate you know, how present-centered versus willing to delay gratification the kid is. And we made, um, uh, in subsequent studies, we made one of the choices real. We're like, take this seriously because you're actually gonna get um, you know, one of, the, one of the things. And if you chose early, then you get the, you know, so. Uh, and then uh, the, my favorite measure, because Marty told me not to do it, so it's also something to remember as you go into your own graduate research, um, that, you know, you, you advisors give advice. Ultimately, you make the decision. So um, I came to Marty one day and I said, we should give kids money, um, we should give them a dollar bill, and it'll be like the marshmallow test. So if they want the dollar bill right now, they can keep it, but they can give it back and then they get $2 later, right? And he's like, I don't think that'll work. Um, and I was like, yeah, I think it's gonna work. And he's like, oh, I don't think that'll work. You know, I don't remember why he said it wouldn't work. So I left his office and we did it anyway. Um, <laughs> so uh, $1 today or $2 in a week. Right? And it turns out that about 20% of the kids <coughs> took the dollar right away, put it in their pocket, went home, and 80% of the kids or so uh, waited. Right? And so we also averaged that decision into this composite score. And one of the most important things I want to teach you about measurement is that since all measures suck right, in their own way, what you can do is take a bunch of sucky measures and put them together, and the average of those measures um, will actually be better than any one measure alone. Right? It's like the basic idea of like triangulating. So if you're going to hire someone, you know, yeah, you could, you could call one reference, or you could call five of them, and you're like, oh, now I see everybody's perspective. That's better information than just calling one person. So that's what we did here. Parents, teachers, self-report, two different ways of measuring delay of gratification. We averaged these all together. That's your self-control score. IQ, in the dotted line, that is a standard IQ test. Right? It was like a standard published test by, um, by uh, you know, a company that published IQ tests. So what we found is that when you measure self-control and IQ in the fall, and then you wait around till the end of the academic year and you measure final grades, the relationship between self-control and grades is stronger in this sample than it is for IQ and grades. So sure, having a higher IQ predicts doing better, but look how steep this line is. If you're in the top 20% of self-control, you're doing actually better than the kids who are in the top 20% of IQ. Um, and so we called this paper something like self-discipline outdoes talent, um, and then there was a colon, and then there was the boring part of the, I don't even remember what the boring part of the title was. Um, and I recently got an email from the editor of Perspectives in Psych Science, because we published this in, in Psych Science, and he said, oh, you know, this article is one of the most cited articles in like whatever, however many decades, so now you get to write about what you've learned since writing this. Um, and I think I'm gonna write like, I did this study uh, as a first year graduate student uh, who, who made a lot of rookie errors, uh, but the one error I didn't make is that I remembered that the most interesting hypotheses come from your life experience, and I had all that time that I spent with kids, all those observations over all those years, and I knew in my bones that there was a good idea here, um, and so my advice to young scholars is to use all of that. Um, and, and yeah, I could teach you statistics, we teach you how to do a lit review, right? Like how to do p-values. Yeah, that, anybody can learn that. Um, but nobody has the life that you led and the insights that you bring uh, to the world. 
Um, okay, so any questions on that? Um, the correlational, longitudinal study? What happens to the dollar and the $2? Oh, well, the dollar and the $2 thing, first I, I went back to Marty and I said, look, you know, the decision that the kids made, and it's a simple measure, I think one of his concerns was is that it's very coarse, right? Like, it's a yes, no, like, did you take it or not? And he had intuition that that wouldn't be a very precise measure, and he was right about that. But it's still correlated with all the other measures of self-control. And even, I think, in this sample, um, just that one measure was as predictive of your grades as actually your IQ score, you know, just knowing that. So, um, yeah, so, you know, and then Marty being a genuine scientist was like, cool. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so, Angela, yeah. you, you just <coughs> predictive a couple of times there, but this is yes. a correlational study. It was a causal. longitudinal correlational study. So, self control and IQ were measured in the fall, and the grades were measured uh, at the end of the year. So, I, it, in that context, it's still legitimate to say that X predicted okay. Y. What would not be legitimate is to say that X caused Y. Right? If it were really cross-sectional, like measured it on May 7th, measured the outcome on May 7th, then, then you'd have to say they're related. Right? Right. So that's the language. When you read these articles, if it's predictive, it's, it's, they're supposed to say predictive is predictive over time. Related means it's cross-sectional usually, and then causal is, uh, is hard to get to. But if you did an experiment, you, know, you might start to use language like led to. So predictive determined. is different than causal for the language. Yeah, predictive is like, so for example, many of you, uh, well not really, I think this is a myth, but people who are like, oh, my knee hurts, it's gonna rain, right? <laughs> uh, my knee hurting predicts the rain, but it's not like causing the rain, right. it's just yeah, right. that, that's the difference. <laughs> yeah.